Good morning. Welcome to Sunday worship here at Trinity United Church of Christ in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, an open and affirming congregation that truly tries to live out the fact that no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. A few announcements to share with you before we move into our formal worship. We are planning on regathering for worship next Sunday. Yay, okay, everybody, yep, that's good. Uh, next Sunday, the 13th of September, we are going to be regathering here in the sanctuary for worship. We're still going to be um, uh, live streaming the worship service over Facebook, so if you are uncomfortable coming to worship here in the building, um, you can still worship with us through Facebook. There are some pretty stringent requirements, one thing, you're going to be required to do if you want to come to worship next Sunday, uh, please call the church office or email our church secretary and let them know that you are planning on coming and how many are coming from your family or from your, your, your party. Uh, this will help us with tracing and tracking if something does happen with COVID. Uh, it also will enable us to uh, put together a seating chart so that we are going to be social distanced here in the sanctuary. Uh, so please, uh, I think you should have received by now or maybe tomorrow or, or Tuesday a letter saying and, and explaining all these uh, procedures, but you also, if you're on the constant contact uh, e-tidings, uh, you should have received that in your email as well. So uh, we are going to try this, we're going to see how it works and um, go from there. A few other announcements to share. Um, first of all, our blessings box. Uh, we did run out of food almost this past week, uh, so we ask that you uh, continue to think about bringing various food items, uh, like has already been said, peanut butter, pasta, spaghetti sauce, tuna, canned beans and vegetable soups, and applesauce, and uh, pancake mix, oatmeal, mac and cheese, individual mac and cheese, potato packets. Uh, also, uh, monetary donations would be appreciated because a lot of times we can go and buy things in bulk. So please keep that um, in the forefront of your minds during the next couple weeks. Uh, also, I want to uh, let you know that our crop walk is going to take place on uh, October the 11th. Um, and uh, this is something that is near and dear to my heart. I'm sort of in charge of it for the Franklin County, for our Waynesboro uh, Fellowship of Churches. Um, and um, I fully intend to win back the trophies um, uh, for most walkers, maybe even for the most money gathered. So that's my goal. But uh, one thing with outdoor um, events like this, we can have up there upwards of 250 people. So I'd love to have 250 people walking on Washington Township Boulevard on October the 11th for World Hunger. You do, you will need to wear a mask, and we're gonna still practice social distancing, but um, please put that on your calendars, and if you are interested in walking, uh, give the office a call. We'll see that you get a sponsor form, or if you're interested in donating, give the office a call, and um, uh, you can sign up with one of the walkers. Those are the announcements that I have. Um, let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship, through our organ prelude this morning. Carol Ann. <laughs>
I invite you now to join in our responsive call to worship. Again, I remind you that I will read the lines that say one, and please join, and we will read together the lines that say all. Tell the whole congregation of God's people, this is a day for new beginnings. This is a time of God's appearing. This is the moment for faithful response. Praise God in the assembly of the faithful. Make melody to God and sing a new song. Praise God for life enriched by love. Praise God for love that fulfills God's law. This is the hour to wake from our sleep. The energy of God's love fills this place. Here we claim our identity as Christians. Here we become the church of Jesus Christ. Let us join together in our unison prayer of invocation. Let us pray together. This is a festival day, glorious God, a day of remembering your faithfulness through the centuries, a time for celebrating your vibrant presence with us, a pause of anticipation for the seasons yet to be. We rejoice at the assurance that you take pleasure in us, that we are known by you called by you, empowered by you, to live honorably and humbly in the spirit of Christ. We would exalt your name and sing for joy, knowing that we can trust you for the guidance and direction we need. Amen. Our ancestors in the faith sometimes sought vengeance on their enemies. But Jesus challenged his friends and us to listen and reconcile with those who, with whom we disagree. Paul counseled followers to put away quarreling and jealousy and, and harmful behavior. There is much in our lives that is harmful to ourselves and others. Much that leads us to brokenness and lasting pain. Let us confess our need for healing through our prayer of confession. Let us pray together. O oh God, we have not been faithful to your commands. We have been more ready to condemn than to console, more eager to justify ourselves than to work for understanding. We feed the flames of dissent instead of welcoming the freeing power of forgiveness. We gather as two or three not to welcome your presence but to gossip about those who are absent. Our sins are destroying us, God. Turn us around to a new way of being. Amen. Salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. 
God's healing presence has come among us and dwells within us. Our openness to God's transforming love releases in us the potential for wholeness. We will be amazed at what we can do and who we can be as humble, joyous followers of the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Thanks be to God for the forgiveness we receive through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. I hope all is well. First of all, I want to thank all of you who have dropped food off for the blessing box this week. It was very needed and helpful. And all you kids, I hope your first week at school has been successful. Uh, all you teachers, I am with you. I'm glad I'm not there. Um, and all staff members at schools, I know this is hard and difficult but eventually we'll get, all, we'll get through it and hopefully we'll get back to some semblance of normal. So for today, it seems like for the past couple weeks, all I've done is talk about getting along with everyone and treating others like you wanna be treated and just simply being kind. It's very interesting. I was talking to Pastor Bruce this morning and the lectionary, that's what it's been. And for 2020, it's been very appropriate. So to me, the most important thing for you to do is to be kind. Well, in Matthew, it says, if someone hurts you, whether it's a friend, brother, sister, or someone you don't care for, go and tell them. Work it out between the two of you. If they listen, you've made a friend. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law, and that's found in Romans. So what does all that mean? Well, Mr. Holland, can you move the camera down to my lovely scale? Sorry about the scale, I wanted a balanced scale, but I couldn't find one anywhere. So, in on my scale, you try to measure things to see what their weight is. And what I'm gonna to try to do today is I'm gonna to try to make things equal and even, okay? And I have rocks. And I think you can see the little red mark there, and that's what I'm trying to get to. And I'll use my pencil to show you where it actually goes when I weigh these rocks. So. It's supposed to be about two pounds. It's very interesting. So I'm gonna take this rock. That's probably about two pounds. So I put it on there. Oh, it goes way up here. Hmm, so that's not right. Maybe a smaller one. Maybe I'll try this one. And it comes up to here. It's still too heavy. Still not on that red line. Let me try a smaller rock. It's still too heavy. This is not easy. Let me get another rock. This is a lot smaller. And it's still too heavy. So maybe I'll leave that one, take that one off. And I have some smaller rocks. And I'm going to drop them all over the place. And it's still too heavy. It's really hard to get it equal and even. And that's kind of what we do in life. Now, has, ever, has anyone ever said something that hurts your feelings? You know they have. Perhaps you were playing with a friend, they called you a name. What did that make you want to do? Did it make you want to get even by calling them a name? You know what? That is just like trying to put stones on my scales to make it equal that red line. It's very difficult. Someone calls you a name, so you call them a name. They don't like that, so they call you another name. And on and on and on the name calling goes. When that happens, it's like building a fence or a wall between yourself and that person. We stop talking to them, don't want to see them, don't want to be around them. But that's not what Jesus wants us to do. Instead of building fences or getting even, he wants us to build a bridge of love 
or talk with the person and work out the problem between us. I've heard people say, and you probably have too, don't get mad, get even. Think about the scale, how difficult that was for me to get that on that red line, to get it even. Very difficult. So here's a better idea. Don't get even, get ahead. How do you do that? Well, Jesus says, if someone hurts you, go and tell them that they hurt you. And tell them, let's work it out between us. If they listen, you've made a friend. You build that bridge between you and that other person. If you try to get even, you're going to lose that friend. But if we forgive someone, we'll make a friend. Jesus didn't call us to be disciples to make other people pay for their bad behavior by hurting them back. Instead, he told us to do what he did, love them and forgive them. Sometimes that's really hard to do, but we can do it if we ask Jesus to help us. So let's say a little prayer. Creator, when someone hurts us, give us a forgiving spirit to talk to them and try to resolve the conflict rather than try to get even by hurting them back. Help us to love and forgive others by building bridges and talking with them in love as you have loved and forgiven us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So remember that this week when you're at school or wherever you are, if somebody calls your name, don't call, a na call them a name to get even. Tell them that hurts your feelings. Talk about it. And hopefully you'll make a friend. Right, have a good week at school. And I'll talk to you next week. Bye. Thank you, Karen. Wonderful message. We move to the reading of our scripture lessons for this morning. Our first scripture lesson is recorded in the Old Testament book of Exodus. I'll be reading from the 12th chapter of Exodus, the first 14 verses of that chapter. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and lentil of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your lions, loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Our second lesson is recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans, reading from the 13th chapter of the book of Romans. Paul says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the, love, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments... You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandments are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. 
The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And our third reading, our gospel reading for this morning is recorded in Matthew's gospel, the 18th chapter beginning with the 15th verse. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen then, tell, them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and wherever, whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Here ends the reading of God's word for this day. May God add a special blessing to the hearing and the doing of God's word. Amen. Let us join our hearts and our minds together in prayer. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of our hearts be upon you, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. With the start of school this past week, in these crazy pandemic times, I'd like to suggest that we get even a little bit crazier this morning. I want to suggest that we go back to high school ourselves for a moment. Let me explain. Maybe there's a lot that you'd like to forget about your high school years. I know there's a lot I'd like to forget from my high school years, but things like peer pressure, or bullies, or the clothes you were wearing back then, or the hairstyles. I look at pictures of, of myself in high school and I can't believe how long my hair was. Oh, and how about gym class <laughs> and having to take showers? One thing about which high school grads agree on is that the textbooks contain some of the most boring, mundane, and sometimes baffling statements that you've ever read in your life. If you've ever spent part of a test period trying to figure out why anyone would care, much less notice, that a train traveling 25 miles an hour from Poughkeepsie passes another train from Peoria going 35 miles an hour in the opposite direction, somewhere in the middle of nowhere then you know what I'm talking about. If you felt inadequate at doing word problems back then, it could be that you weren't really very good at math, or perhaps it was actually the fault of the textbook writer. Unclear, blooperish, and nonsensical questions sometimes appeared in those 40-pound books that you had to lug back and forth to class, which could explain that C that you got in algebra back in the day. A website called Thanks Textbooks now offers a fascinating look at the myriad of ways in which educational writing can make students actually more confused than proficient. It's almost as though these textbook writers lived in a different world or a different reality than the one that we, the rest of us, inhabit. 
a world where someone gets random condiments on a, on a hamburger, where eating 27 pieces of pizza is normal, and where someone actually contemplates the weight of his or her favorite orange. It's no wonder that, it's no wonder that many students look at this stuff in the textbooks and say things like, I'm never going to use this. You may not remember the last time you played a game with complex numbers, if ever, but there are certain pieces of information that are both useful and necessary to your daily life. That's especially true when it comes to the Christian life. For that, we need clear directions with practical applications in order to deal with the real world problems that exist in our lives. Fortunately for us, the Apostle Paul gives us the book of Romans, or his letter to the Romans, which we might consider a textbook for the Christian life. Paul wasn't simply dreaming up problems for his churches to solve. Indeed, Paul oftentimes answered questions that the people in the first century world didn't even know they needed to ask. Romans itself isn't the easiest book to read and understand with its paragraph-long sentences and its lengthy arguments, but it, off it offers some of the most practical and useful advice for living in a world where things often don't make sense. In particular, chapters 12 to 16 give some practical ideas for living out the theology and worldview that Paul gives us in chapters 1 through 11. As part of that section, the clarity of Paul's instructions here in the 13th chapter, verses 8 to 14, offers the answer key to a whole lot of problems in living the life of Christ in the world. For Paul, just as it was for Jesus, the primary answer to any problem that one might encounter in life is love. Paul says, owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves has fulfilled the law. The law, Paul points to here, in, is the commandments from Exodus 20. Ten very clear statements from the biblical textbook about the way life is to be lived in the community of God's people. But like any word problem, staring at these commandments for a long period of time can lead to looking for loopholes or alternative interpretations. That's why Paul reveals the basis behind the commandments as the guiding principle for answering almost every question and every test the Christian might encounter. The commandments, Paul said, are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. If one truly loves one's neighbor, then other sins, and here he names adultery, stealing, murder, coveting, these things are not possible because if you love someone, then you will never do those things. Paul echoes Jesus here. Jesus who preached that the greatest commandments are the love of God and neighbor. On these two commandments, Jesus said, hang all the law and the prophets. Whatever the question might be for Christian behavior, be it about eating or playing games or relationships or engagement with the world, about being the church or even running away from elephants, the answer to the question is love. Now that's not an easy answer, especially when Jesus told us to love more, to love even our enemies. Paul writes to the church in Rome, which was struggling under the thumb of the emperor, the emperor of Rome, the Roman world would be hostile to Christians for about 300 years, but even then, Paul says that the answer to the questions on the civics test is love and respect. Pay to all what is due them, says Paul. Taxes to whom taxes are due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. 
even when confronted with the power and injustice of the world, the Christian's answer must be love. It's not a, a squishy, meek kind of love that Paul's talking about here, nor is it a quantitative, like another textbook question that might be asked, something like, the ratio of hugs to kisses at the family reunion was four to one. If there were 148 hugs, how many kisses were there? The answer is 37. But rather, the kind of love that Paul's talking about is the love that forgives rather than retaliates, that promotes peace instead of conflict. If an appeal to love is not enough to convince people to behave themselves, Paul plays the eschatological card. We better watch out because salvation is nearer to us now than when we became, became believers. We should therefore stop messing around and make no provision for the flesh, but instead put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Like a student watching the clock while taking the SATs, Paul sees that the time is nearly up for the present world. The day of the Lord, the eschaton, is close at hand. The day when every person will be graded on their deeds and on the way they live their lives. And so, Paul says, it's time to stop trying to analyze the questions and get busy checking the most important boxes. Again, he says, let us lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let, it, let us live honorably as in the day, not in re revealing and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. In other words, live now as though you've already passed the test. Students who envision themselves being successful and who put extra time into study tend not to be surprised when odd and anomalous questions appear on the test. Paul invites us to engage in good habits that lead to success in contrast to lazy and licentious students who will flunk the ultimate final. This is Paul's textbook advice to those of us who are confronted with strange questions and conundrums every day. Things like, what's the right answer when your boss treats you unfairly? What's the proper response when your friend gets the scholarship that you thought you deserved? What box do you check when you have to send in your taxes? How do you deal with a nasty neighbor who lets his dog poop in your yard? What do you do about the fact that there are just some people that you just don't like? What do you do with a problem in one of your current relationships? How do you handle a problem with your finances or your career? How do you respond to a problem with one of your family, family members? Do you have a problem with self-esteem, self-acceptance, appearance, or health? There's no easy answers, but they all begin with love. Unconditional, willful, sacrificial, Christ-like love. Paul urges the Roman Christians to go into debt. This is the message for us on this particular Sunday during this Labor Day weekend. The debt we're talking about here is the debt of love. Owe no one anything, Paul says, except to love one another. That's what we owe. This is our obligation as Christians. This is principle that we're never, never, ever, ever going to be able to pay off. There will never be a time when we can say, well, okay, I guess I love my neighbor long enough. I guess I've loved my brothers and sisters in Christ enough now. I guess I've, I've loved the poor and the homeless enough. I guess I've loved my family members enough now. So I'm taking a break from love. No more love for me for a while. I've paid off my love debt. When someone has done us wrong, we simply place 
a love lean on them, L-I-E-N. She didn't really deal with me fairly and square, but I'm just going to lean a little love on her. Love is the fulfilling of the law, the Bible says. When you consider credit card debt in America is a whopping $413.7 billion from one month to another. That's sort of mind boggling, isn't it? And yet there's very little love debt around these days, is there? We need to find a way to put ourselves into less financial debt, but rather to go into a love debt. We have to figure out a way to move from the dog-eat-dog -dog world mindset, where people are climbing over top of each other to get ahead, or they're putting other people down or making fun of them in order to feel better about themselves, or just hating people for no reason other than they're different from us. If we can do that, if we can do that, our neighborhoods, our churches, our communities, our cities, our world is going to be a better place. May it be so for all of us. Amen.
Thank you, Jillian and Deb. As I listened to that wonderful song, that was one of the favorite songs to be sung up at Hartman Center. And it reminded me that uh, this coming Saturday, the 12th of September, will be a celebration celebrating uh, the many years that Hartman Center has been providing camps for children of all ages. Um, as many of you know, uh, the decision was made by our board of directors at a conference to sell the camp. Um, and this Saturday is a celebration of everything that the camp has meant to so many people over the years. I know Nard and I will be going up for the celebration, which begins at 10 o'clock in the morning um, with a hike of the knob, if you want to hike the knob one last time. If you don't know what the knob is, then I'll fill you in, just call me. But uh, uh, this is an opportunity to celebrate the ministry that has been so special uh, in the life of so many people at Hartman Center. Few announcements, few uh, prayer concerns to share with you as we come to this portion of our worship experience where we lift each other up in our prayers. Um, we want to keep Harold Stumbaugh in our prayers. Harold was still having some issues uh, in regards to his recent heart uh, uh, surgery. Don Sorakin is currently in the Chambersburg Hospital. Um, he's not doing real well. He's uh, retaining fluid. He's having some um, heart issues as well as, well as some kidney issues. Uh, so please keep Don and Elsie Sorakin in your prayers. Also received word that Melinda Ag Aglin England, uh, Maggie, uh, is in the hospital up in Maine. Uh, she got to the point where she was just really dizzy. She couldn't walk without being dizzy. Uh, so they're running some tests. Uh, she's feeling better this morning, but they're still planning on running maybe an, uh, an MRI or some other tests to try and figure out what is going on um, with her. Um, I want to share some thoughts as we move into and throughout this season of the year that we know as an election time. And I want to talk this morning as your pastor a little bit about Facebook and other social medias. My friends, before you post or repost anything on Facebook, I want to suggest to you that you make sure that you have checked your sources, that what you are reposting is true. Don't just repost something because you agree with it. And I want to suggest that you not repost something that's negative or a post that is devised to inflame diversity or inflame division or, or separate people or, or push people farther apart in nature. And when responding to a post, I want to suggest that you don't name call somebody. You heard uh, Ms. Karen this morning in the uh, children's sermon talking about getting even or trying to get even when somebody else calls you a name and stupid is part is a, is a name as well. Don't lecture or try to correct someone else's way of looking at things. Just share what you think or what you believe. Remember that even though we have different views Politically, theologically, we are still all create creations of God and we are called to love first. And remember, dialogue is good, but getting into an online argument is fruitless and will just make you and the person that you're arguing with mad and increase your blood pressure. So please, before you do anything on social media, Remember the command of Jesus to love first. Let's join our hearts and our minds together in prayer. Gracious God, just as you rescued the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt, setting them free to worship and serve you, so you have also rescued us setting us free from slavery to sin and selfishness and inviting us into relationship with you and one another. We praise you for the love and mercy you have shown toward us. You call us to love and serve you, 
by loving and serving our brothers and sisters, both near and far, to put their needs and interests ahead of our own, and so to fulfill your law of love. And so we offer our prayers for the world that you created. We pray for those who do not have what they need in order to survive, those without enough food and water, medical care, shelter, or security. Open our hearts to see the needs in our world and to respond with your love. We pray for those who are living with serious illness or injury, who face each day with uncertainty or pain, who find themselves wondering what the future holds for them. On this Labor Day weekend, we remember those who have no work, who are struggling to provide for their families, and who despair of ever finding em employment again. We also pray for your church, the body of Christ on earth. We pray that we would be a living example to your love in our world, treating one another with compassion and respect, setting, settling differences with love and integrity, bound together by our common allegiance to you. We praise you for the way of love modeled for us by Jesus himself. Open our hearts and lives to your ongoing presence among us so that we would grow in faithfulness and love and bring honor to your name. This we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come to the portion of our worship service where we talk about and think about how we are being stewards of all the things that God has blessed us with. And obviously, we can't take an offering this morning, but we can virtually respond to God's gifts by doing the things in our lives that are important to God. We can look out, we can reach out and help one another we can share our ties, share our talents and our, and our time with other people. And we can also share our treasure by either mailing or doing whatever possible to send your gifts into the church office. We are still open. You know, this, I, I mentioned that we are regathering for worship next week, but the church is still open. The church has been open. Uh, during this entire six months of pa pandemic. So please respond uh, through, respond to the gifts that God has blessed you by sending your tithes, by sharing your talents, by sharing your, your time with one another. Let us join together in our prayer of dedication. May these offerings help to free your people, O God, from bondage to sin. Unite us in a community of mutual caring in which differences are resolved as we listen to one another and seek to offer understanding. May the light of your love shine through all our efforts to share your good news. Keep us in the light when we are tempted to ignore and violate your commandments. With these prayers, we dedicate our gifts. Amen.
are God's servants sent on a mission. Let us make God's deeds known among the people. We are ready ourselves to go where God sends us. High praises to God will be in our throats. Owe no one, owe no one anything except to love one another. Keep the commandments God has given. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. God grants victory over sin to the humble. Rejoice, for God takes pleasure in us. Where two or three are gathered, God is with us. We seek to live honorably in the spirit of Christ. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Thanks be to God and all God's people said, Amen.